In this pair of lectures, we're going to work through the law that applies to government tracking of cell phones. The first lecture addresses historical cell phone location records, and the next lecture explains prospective cell phone location tracking. I would like to proceed in four segments. First, we'll look at the technology used for historical cell phone location tracking. Next, we'll work through the status of cell phone location data under the Stored Communications Act. Third, we'll explore the debate on whether the Fourth Amendment protects cell phone location information. Last, I'll share a little data on historical cell phone tracking. So, let's start with the technology. There are quite a few ways to locate a cell phone, including, in rough order of increasing accuracy, cell towers, the satellite-based global positioning system, nearby Wi-Fi networks, and low-power Bluetooth beacons. We're going to focus on cell towers, since they're the most easily accessible form of tracking data, and since, for now at least, they're the most commonly used form of tracking data in law enforcement investigations. The same principles of law would generally apply to these other technologies. So, we're focused on tracking with cell towers. That sort of data is usually called Cell Site Location Information, or CSLI for short. The basic idea is straightforward. A cell network consists of a set of cell towers, and a person's cell phone connects to those towers. Let's start with a simplification, and assume Alice's phone always connects to the nearest tower. As Alice physically moves around, her phone hops between towers. Alice's phone company keeps a list of which towers she was connected to and when. The company also keeps a list of where its towers are located. By combining those two lists, it's very easy to get a rough estimate of where Alice has been. Phone companies don't handle this information in a uniform way. Collection practices differ substantially. Some services only grab a phone's location when a call is placed or received, while other businesses keep track at all times. Retention periods also differ substantially. Some telecoms throw away location information after several months, while others hang on to it for years. I think it's fair to say that the market trend is toward much more collection and much longer retention. This table comes from a March 2011 report prepared by federal prosecutors and investigators. As you can see, the phone companies greatly differ in their retention practices. All right, so that was the very simplified version of cell site location information where Alice's phone connected to just one tower. In fact, cell phones connect to multiple towers at the same time. That's how your phone keeps a call connected even though you're moving. So, instead of recording just a single tower that a phone is connected to, a phone company often records a set of towers and associated signal strengths. Just from this data, it's easy to see that Alice moved from near tower one on the left side of the screen, to near Tower 3, on the right side of the screen. So, there's a set of signal strengths, as observed at multiple towers. That's enough information to triangulate the position of a phone. Triangulation provides a much more precise location estimate than just being near a particular tower. Changes to cell phone infrastructure have made location estimates much more precise. One major upgrade has just been antenna density. Cities are now blanketed with redundant cell coverage, and cell antennae are all over the place, not just on dedicated towers. Moreover, some antennae have a very small service area, making location inferences particularly easy. Another change is the increasing introduction of antennae that are used solely to help locate a phone they don't actually carry any voice or data. Those are cropping up all over, too. Finally, 
cell networks have increasingly honed the directionality of antennae. That also greatly improves the precision of cell phone location. The punchline to all of this is, using just cell site information, it's now possible to locate a phone to within about 50 to 100 meters. If you're into American sports metaphors, that's roughly placing you into a football field. And if you're into not American sports metaphors, that's about a football pitch. Okay, so there's the technology behind cell phone location tracking. Now let's turn to the Stored Communications Act. As I hope you recall, the Stored Communications Act is the part of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that deals with retrospective information. There are three categories of data that we've already seen under the SCA. The first consists of account information, as well as connection and session records. Law enforcement can access that category with just a subpoena. The second category consists of content. To access that, investigators need a warrant. Finally, there's the catch-all category of non-content. That requires a de-order. Placing cell location information into the SCA categories is pretty easy. It's definitely not account information, and it doesn't seem to fit within the language on connection or session records. It's also certainly not the content of a communication. So, that leaves the catch-all category for non-content and there's fairly widespread agreement that that's the right statutory category. So, under the SCA, cell phone location history is accessible with a deorder. As I hope you recall, a deorder is like a mini-warrant. It still requires permission from a judge, but the standard is lower. I also hope you recall that the SCA does not provide for statutory suppression, so, if police get location information without a valid deorder, then under the SCA, the information is still admissible in a criminal prosecution. There is a minority view, held by a few magistrate and district court judges, that cell location information constitutes a, quote, tracking device, unquote. We haven't discussed it, but there's a special carve-out from ECPA for tracking devices. The text of that carve-out seems like it might apply to cell phones, though the legislative history appears to focus exclusively on physical tracking gadgets. So, under this view, cell location information isn't covered by the deorder authority under ECPA. The view also suggests that a warrant is sometimes constitutionally required though the reasoning for that is separate and it doesn't necessarily follow. Anyway, there's the minority view. Again, the overwhelming majority of courts that have considered this issue have held that the deorder provisions apply to cell location information. There is one other point of disagreement under the SCA that I'd like to address. That's the question of whether a judge has statutory discretion to require a warrant for non-content. Put differently, courts have split on whether a judge can find reasonable suspicion, but nevertheless say investigators have to come back with probable cause. Courts that hold in favor of discretion emphasize the SCA's language about how a deorder may be issued. They note that the statute does not read shall be issued. The Third Circuit has held that magistrate judges have statutory discretion to reject a deorder and require a warrant. The Fifth Circuit flatly disagrees and says that under the SCA, magistrate judges have to issue a deorder once they find reasonable suspicion. Okay, so that's the status of cell location information under the SCA. The majority view is that it's covered by a deorder, the minority view is that it's not covered by a deorder, and there's disagreement on whether a judge has statutory discretion to require a warrant instead of a deorder. Now let's turn to cell site information 
under the Fourth Amendment. There are three separate strands of doctrine that intersect at cell location information. One strand is the CATS test, which we've already seen. It's the default test for whether a search has occurred, and it asks whether a person expected privacy and whether that expectation was reasonable. The second strand is the third-party doctrine. We've already covered that, too. The third strand is sometimes called the public movement doctrine. I'll touch on that in just a moment. How these three strands interact is not entirely clear. The most common way in which courts and scholars juggle them is to consider the third-party doctrine and the public movement doctrine to be specific applications of the CATS test. Where a court applies either of those doctrines, then there is no reasonable expectation of privacy under CATS. There certainly are other ways to synthesize these three strands, but again, this is the most common. Now let me explain what this public movement doctrine is. In a pair of 1980s cases, the Supreme Court addressed police use of physical tracking gadgets. The first case held that there is no Fourth Amendment protection for movements on public roads. The rationale was, roughly, that individuals knowingly disclose their location to the public, so there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in public movements. To a large degree, that rationale makes the public movement doctrine a close cousin of the third-party doctrine. Another rationale for the doctrine is that the police could just tail a person in public, and that's never been a Fourth Amendment issue. So this is just an electronically assisted tail. All right, that's the first case. The second case held that once the tracking gadget went into a home, then there was Fourth Amendment protection, and a warrant was required. Those two rationales about public roads no longer applied, and the home has long represented a special zone of protection in Fourth Amendment law. The exact effect of the public movement doctrine is very unclear. A strong view, articulated by some courts, is that it totally eliminates constitutional protection for information about public movements. That's definitely an overstatement of what the doctrine does, but it's a way the doctrine gets invoked that avoids difficult issues. A weak view, which is certainly more accurate, though less often articulated, is that learning a person's movements isn't inherently a search, but gaining access to the movements might be a search. Put differently, the fact that police learn your movements doesn't itself trigger the Fourth Amendment, but how the police learn your movements can trigger the Fourth Amendment. If you say where you've been on a phone call, for example, that's call content, and it's constitutionally protected. Similarly, if police physically install a GPS tracker on your car, that's a search, and your public movements are protected as derivative of that search. So, the weak view is that location information doesn't create an expectation of privacy, but it also doesn't destroy an expectation of privacy. Finally, some courts just apply this area of law by abstract analogy. If a technology seems like a tracking gadget, then there's no Fourth Amendment protection. And if a technology seems sufficiently different from a tracking gadget, then there might be Fourth Amendment protection. When they're drawing these analogies, courts often emphasize the duration and the precision of tracking, as well as the possibility of widespread tracking. Okay, so that's the public movement doctrine. Perhaps unsurprisingly, courts have been all over the place in how they apply these three strands of doctrine to cell phone tracking data. Some courts apply a freestanding CATS test and hold it's protected. Others apply the same test and find it's unprotected. 
and others yet just don't talk much about cats. As for the third-party doctrine, some courts say it applies since cell tracking data is volunteered to the phone company, while other courts say the doctrine is distinguishable, and some other courts mostly ignore it. Finally, the public movement doctrine is also a mess. Some courts say it applies, and cell tracking information is therefore unprotected. Other courts say the public movement doctrine cases are distinguishable and don't eliminate protection. A few courts have emphasized a mosaic theory where long-term public movements make the doctrine inapplicable. The idea is that a sufficient aggregation of unprotected pieces of tracking data form a complete picture of a person's life, much like the tiles of a mosaic form an image. At least four justices of the Supreme Court appear ready to adopt some flavor of the mosaic theory and require a warrant for long-term tracking. Finally, some courts just don't talk much about the public movement doctrine. As illustration, let me show how some federal appellate courts have ruled. The Sixth Circuit, in a pair of cases, has just applied the public movement doctrine by analogy. It hasn't really talked about cats or the third party doctrine. It has, though, left the door open to the mosaic theory. The Third Circuit also has applied the public movement doctrine, but it's addressed the third party doctrine too, and held that it's distinguishable. The Fifth Circuit has done nearly the opposite. It just applied the third party doctrine and it didn't say much about cats or the public movement doctrine. Finally, in a recent opinion, the 11th Circuit held that cell location data is protected under cats. It leaned heavily on the Supreme Court's recent holding that physically attaching a GPS tracking device to a car requires a warrant. The panel reasoned that a minor physical trespass shouldn't be the determining factor in constitutional privacy law. That opinion was vacated, and at the time of this recording, the case is scheduled for en banc rehearing. So there you have it. Courts are all over the place on whether cell location data is constitutionally protected and why. The majority view in 2014 remains that cell location data is unprotected. That said, there has been substantial movement away from that view, and the Supreme Court could well step in. All right, enough about the Fourth Amendment. The last topic for this lecture is a little data on cell location information. Both AT&T and Verizon have published the number of location data demands that they received in 2013. AT&T was served with over 37,000, and Verizon with about 35,000. So, law enforcement agencies are making quite substantial use of cell phone location tracking. AT&T's transparency report helpfully provides a breakdown of types of location data demands. Historical demands, which we've been discussing, are the most common. Prospective demands, which are the subject of the next lecture, are hardly rare. The last category, tower dumps, covers a special sort of historical demand. A tower dump is a list of phones that are in certain areas at certain times. So it's like the reverse of an ordinary historical demand. Tower dumps are particularly controversial because they can sweep in hundreds or thousands of innocent bystanders. Okay, so there's the breakdown of types of location demands. As for the legal procedures used to compel location data, Verizon's reports bring some clarity. About two-thirds of location demands use a deorder, and about one-third have a full-blown warrant. This data reiterates that the majority view in the courts, for now, is that cell phone location data is not protected by the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. All right. That's the data I wanted to share about cell phone location tracking, 
And that brings this lecture to a close. In the next lecture, we're going to take a brief look at the law surrounding prospective cell phone tracking.